uh, chapter 35, this is 80 slides, so I'm going to work through this pretty quickly. Patients with special challenges, this is typically a difficult section for EMTs because it's not what you guys are used to. So, disability is a condition interfering with the ability to engage in activities, uh, maybe a developmental disability like cerebral palsy or Down syndrome. Results of traumatic injury or medical condition, could be multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, stroke, TBI, or spinal cord injury. Many of these patients can't live in independently with some accommodations. Here's a blind patient, they may want to touch your face, they may want to grab your arm. This is a little hard for us if we're not used to it, but I encourage you to let them do that and just use a lot of hand sanitizer afterwards, okay? Terminal illness could be progressive fatal diseases, end-stage cancer, heart failure, kidney failure, Huntington's disease or Lou Gehrig's disease, these are all terminal illnesses. May they depend on technology to sustain life or relieve pain. They may already have advanced directives. They may not want to be resuscitated. And we may have to think about their emotional needs a little bit differently. Obesity is classified as a body mass index of 30 or more. Okay? You would not believe how much of uh, the people you know are technically obese. All right? Uh, most of us fall in the overweight category according to the BMI indexes. It's a significantly growing problem in the United States. There are special merit measures to care for obese patients, allow the patient to assume comfortable position for breathing. We want to make them as comfortable as possible and have plenty of assistance when lifting or moving these patients. They can put a significant strain on us and or cause injury. So, homelessness and poverty. Serious health problems related to homelessness and poverty. Mental health problems, malnutrition, substance abuse problems, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and pneumonia. Autism affects 1 in 68 children. Affects ability to communicate. They need to modify assessment techniques and treatment protocol. Very difficult sometimes. ABC is dealing with patients who have autism. We've got to be, have awareness. Stay very basic. Be calm and slow and act safely. Sometimes these patients can be violent. EMT must adapt approach to strategies to the patient. Disruption routine will not be well tolerated. Communication can be extremely challenging and they may have escalation or meltdown including involuntary tantrum like behavior. It's very good to use caregivers in this situation. Have them help you communicate to keep them calm. Okay, Basic means less stuff. Don't throw a bunch at them. Ask basic questions. Keep your instructions basic. Keep your treatments basic. Okay? If you don't need to do an IV, don't do an IV. Well, that's for paramedics. But if you don't need to do something to them, don't do it. <laughs> if you stay calm, they'll stay calm. Calm creates calm. Start with one-on-one -on -one contact with a clear, controlled voice. Be empathetic and compassionate, but take your time. Once again, patient you need to go slow with. If I'm throwing a lot at them, they're going to get worked up. It's going to be a problem. Unless it's life-threatening, follow the patient's timeline. Let dispatch know you're going to be on a call for a little bit longer. Begin treatment where patient is found. Remove things that may aggravate the child. Do a toe-to-head survey. We got toe-to-head, 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 toe-to-head survey. One step at a time. Why would we start toe-to-head? We're trying to gain their trust before we get up in their face and they're they're spatially here. Unless this is a ABC life-threatening emergency, we're going to do a toe-to-head survey. Consider taking breaks. Tell the patient what, let the patient tell you when they're ready for the next step. So some general considerations responding to patients with special challenges. How about advanced, advanced medical device in the home? Medical advances in insurance coverage allow more medical devices and care at home. Results in more conditions that EMTs did not previously encounter. So, these really sick people are living at home in our county. We may have never seen these people before because they normally go to a hospital and stay there. Well, now they can live at home. So calls could be for a problem with the patient's device or a medical or traumatic problem unrelated to the device. So here we're seeing, um, you know, this patient's on a ventilator through a trach. They've got IV bags hanging. Um, and they may be calling us because they got feeding lines, right? They may be calling us because their ventilator stopped working or is, is having problems on the fritz. Something we have to then help them and what we pretty much will have to tell them is we can bag them to the hospital and they can get their ventilator worked on. Okay? Or they may be out of oxygen. Maybe we supply them with some oxygen until their home care company can get out. 
So we may go to calls at private residence, nursing homes, rehab centers, and specialized care facilities. Um, you know, at, at these homes, caregivers, and I'm, I'm talking about private homes here, caregivers are the best trained. They, they have gone through the training on how to work that device, and they typically know what's going on, unless it's their first day at home. They typically have a really good idea. So has this problem occurred before? What fixed it? Have you been taught how to fix this problem? Have you tried to fix it? How do you normally move the patient? How can th Those caregivers are extremely knowledgeable, especially in the home. They can help us get their family member out in a good way that benefits everybody. And it depends on the patient's mental, mental status. Sometimes the patient may know all this stuff about their own equipment. They may not be able to physically do it. They may need you to do it, but they may know what needs to be done. And you need to explain what's going on no matter what the condition, okay? So is the problem with the device? Is it life-threatening? Do I know how to fix it or have I never seen this before? Can I remove them from the device and still treat them? And if that's the case, maybe that's what we need to do until we can get the situation figured out. So diseases and conditions. We could have congenital disease. What does that mean? They're born with it, right? Congenital heart disease, a cleft palate, congenital deafness. There's also acquired diseases, COPD, AIDS, traumatic spinal cord injury, or deafness. So special concerns, patient with a chronic disease may experience sudden worsening. Patient may also develop an acute illness. Advanced, advanced medical devices. So you can have a CPAP device. Lots of people have CPAP devices for sleep apnea, right? It's a form of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. CPAP is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. So if there was a quest, test question about how CPAP works and it's continuous positive airway pressure, that would probably mean that when a patient breathes in, there's pressure, and when a patient breathes out, there's still pressure, right? Because it's continuous positive airway pressure. And what that positive airway pressure does is it prevents the alveoli from collapsing. Okay, so here's an example of a CPAP machine. Um, EMT assessment and transport. Problems not usually related to the machine. Patient may wish to bring the machine to the hospital. Typically, alert hospital personnel of use of CPAP uh, device during sleep uh, in radio report. Let the, let the hospital know and bring it with you if it's not huge. Trach tubes. It's a surgical opening through the neck, the stoma, into the trachea, in which a breathing tube is placed. A VVM fits on the end of a tube. These typically build up with mucus in the tube. Patient may or may not be able to speak. Okay? So... We're going to do an assessment and transport. We're going to check the tube. If the tube is clogged, we're going to insert a whistle tip catheter into the stoma. The patient may buck a little bit during suction. We may need to ventilate with a BVM. During transport, elevate the patient's head to allow drainage. This is really important, okay? If you get a person with a lot of stoma goo or gunk, and it is gunky, it's nasty, you may have to sit them up um, and get them taken care of, okay? Home ventilators, they range in size from several pounds to over 20 pounds. They're attached to the ventilator circuit that enters the trachea, normally through the stoma there. Patient may lead to very active life. Problems in Kilu, these mucus plugs that we're talking about and secretions, uh, plugs up, and the ventilator has a hard time pushing through. Um, and the settings are tailored to the patient, so you may have to pop that ventilator off, suction that stoma, go from there. Right there's the ventilator, the tubing, the stoma. So, EMT assessment and transport, make sure vent tube has no mucus buildup, no mucus plugs, and they are nasty. Sure that BVM is connected to oxygen. If the ventilator's not working, take it off. Use a BVM and back vacuum. Okay. Implanted pacemakers and cardiac defibrillators. The pacemaker is a small device implanted under the skin and wires are implanted to the heart. Designed to prevent the heart rate from becoming too slow. If Tabitha's here on one of our classes, We'll have, you show, have her show you her pacemaker. She's our 30-year-old uh, paramedic that got a pacemaker. Um, it can happen to anybody, and they really do save lives. Delivers a slow, series of low-energy pulses at set intervals to stimulate the heart to beat at a faster rate. Automatic implanted cardiac defibrillator implanted in the uh, upper left chest or upper left abdominal quadrant. 
detects life-threatening cardiac rhythms, delivers a shock to correct the dysrhythmia. The shock can be very painful, but cannot be felt by caregivers. And that's kind of true, except for when they're in cardiac arrest and it shocks them and their arm comes up and hits you in the face, which has happened to me, or hits somebody in, in an inappropriate place. That hurts, and it does happen. So, um, if these are going off, we want to request ALS, treat as a high-risk cardiac patient, provide high concentration of oxygen, frequently reassess, uh, be ready, have your pads on, if cardiac arrest, use the CPR and AED as indicated. LVADs, left ventricular assist devices. Uh, this patient's holding a battery that keeps his heart pumping pretty much, okay? And the LVAD controller is there in his belt. So, while patient waiting for a suitable donor for a heart transplant, LVAD serves as a bridge. It serves as a bridge of one of two things. It serves as a bridge to life through a heart transplant or it serves as a bridge to death, okay? Eventually, uh, the patient will if they don't get a heart transplant or aren't suitable for a heart transplant, um, it, it extends their years until they do die. Moves blood from the left ventricle through an inserted tube to a pump implanted in the abdomen. Blood pressurized and sent to the aorta for transport to the body. Okay? These things are very technical. Um, if they fail, the patient will likely die. Okay? LVAD assist devices. Uh, Infection, air leakage, and battery failure can be our problems. EMT assessment and transport, battery failure, we want to plug in that thing as fast as we can and keep it plugged in. Pump failure, there's normally a hand or foot pump we can use to supplement. The battery should be secured so it's not pulling on the tubing. You will not feel a radial pulse with an LVAD. It's like a constant pump, okay? So you're not going to feel a pulse, radial or carotid. Um, you shouldn't start CPR unless you think they're dead, okay? So if, the, if you do some stimulus and they aren't waking up talking to you, then you can start CPR. But uh, most of these patients are just, they're fine. They just, you're not going to get a pulse or blood pressure. GI devices, feeding tubes. you got nasogastric tubes, enters through the nose into the stomach, or gastrostomy tube through the abdominal, abdominal wall into the stomach. It's a longer term nutrition device. A lot of patients will get these when they are not taking in food or little kids when they have to boost their food intake will get a uh, G tube. Okay, common problems include dislodgement, infection, and clogging. These things get nasty, nasty, nasty. Okay, so infection is very common with these things or sometimes they get pulled out and then uh, they can get infected as well and cause all kinds of problems, okay? We've got to make sure the tube is secured to the patient's body with tape prior to transport. Keep nutrients, nutrients higher than uh, the tube. Put a protective cap in place to prevent leakage. Like I said, if they, they don't keep these things clean, they can really be nasty. So here's uh, a mom administering through a G-tube some food. So urinary catheters, patient has lost ability to urinate control when they urinate. Most commonly indwelling Foley catheters or externally applied condom catheters. We pretty much just see the Foley catheters. I haven't seen a condom catheter in a long, long time. Drains down the leg into a bag. Problems include infection, blockage, urine discoloration, dislodgement. Most of these patients end up having UTIs at some point in their life. Okay? During transport, keep the catheter bag lower than the patient but not on the floor. Document discoloration or odor. If that urine smells like the worst thing you've ever smelled in your life, and it's got like, uh, it's cloudy or, you know, chunky or dark brown, that, they have a UTI about guaranteed. Empty the bag if it's one third to one half full. That's a really good job for somebody who works at a hospital. I do not empty these because I don't have anything really to empty them into. And document how much you do empty if you empty it. Here's a good example. This guy has a Foley catheter, it looks like, and it's going to be secured there to his leg, run up into his penis, and then down into the Foley bag down here. It keeps it off the floor, but keeps it lower than where it attaches to the patient. Um, ostomy bags, connect to the side of the colostomy or ileostomy. It's not visible through clothing. Uh, a lot of times you'll get an infection at the stoma site, blockage, or dislodgement. These things are nasty, nasty. The bag breaks. Oh gosh, that smells horrific. Ostomy bags. Use care when transporting the patient. Objective is to prevent 
breakage or dislodgement. Amen. You do not want that to happen. Prevent it at all costs. Dialysis. Patient has renal failure. Dialysis replaces function of the kidneys. It's our waste removal and fluid removal. You would not believe how many patients are on dialysis. Uh, every day, literally hundreds of thousands of people across the United States go for dialysis. There's dialysis centers in every town, maybe sometimes multiple. There's tons of people that need dialysis. So this is a real thing. A lot of times these people will call 911 while they're at the dialysis clinic. They're starting to feel sick. They get too much pulled off or whatever the case is. Uh, dialysis replaces the function of the kidneys. It's going to remove waste products and fluid um, and help that patient feel a little bit better. But sometimes during the process they get, they get sick. Okay. Um, hemodialysis is performed by attaching a patient to an external dialyzer, usually at a dialysis center. They use large needles and tubing, uh, remove and return blood. Complications a lot of times, bleeding from their AV fistula uh, or infection. So these patients will have a fistula in one of their arms, it's normally right by the AC. It'll be this big old chunky looking, it'll, you'll think it's a vein, it's a huge port right there. and so. When they do that, you can't take a blood pressure in that arm, so they may tell you, hey, no, I got an AV fistula, I can't take a blood pressure over here. So just be aware of that. Um, we're not supposed to start IVs in that arm either. Um, and these ports are really important for them because it allows them to live. So we gotta take good care of them, okay? And a lot of times they have bleeding from that. Our first goal is always direct pressure. Uh, we wanna try to stop that up with direct pressure first and uh, a good pressure bandage if we can. If we absolutely have to, we can use a tourniquet, but remember that uh, that could ruin that AV fistula completely. Most likely will. Peritoneal dialysis is a little bit different. They have a permanent catheter implanted through the abdominal wall into the peritoneal cavity. The dialysis solution runs into the abdominal cavity and ultimately drains back into the dialysis bag to be discarded. Complications is dislodging of the catheter and infection. Uh, they're doing these at home, so that may be something you can see at home sometimes and have to take them out. Do not take blood pressure on any arm with navy shunt fistula or graft. Rupture of the shunt fistula or graft causes fast, significant blood loss. Direct pressure to control the bleeding, treat for shock, and transport. Central IV catheters. Surgically inserted for long-term delivery of medications or fluids. IV chemotherapy, uh, parent maternal nutrition. They have PIC lines, peripherally inserted central catheters or central venous lines. Um, these are imp implanted ports. A lot of times they'll get uh, infections at the site. You've got to be extremely careful. I've done several of these in the ER, and um, it is, well, access several ports. I haven't imp imp implanted the ports, but they can get infected very easily, okay? So use of central IV usually is restricted to hospital per per personnel. Be aware of the type of catheter and avoid timing, avoid contamination. Physical impairments. Hearing, sight, or speech, each limitation requires different assessment and treatment approaches. Uh, physical impairment does not mean mental impairment, and that's really important. These people can be fully with it. So don't treat them any different. Not that you shouldn't treat anybody any different, but be careful. If you make a, a snide comment, they're going to hear it, and they're going to understand it, and they're going to know it. So we've got to provide assistance as necessary, assess their impairment, whether or not it's baseline or new. Once again, this is where family members can help, and even the patient can help. This is new. I, you know, I, I've, I've been in a wheelchair for a while, but I can't move my left side. Well, they may be having a massive stroke. We need to watch for that, right? And bring their aids required by the patient. If they walk with a cane, bring the cane. We don't like to do that. We don't like to bring walkers and canes. Why? Because we don't have a lot of room in our ambulance, but we should bring them if we physically can. So abuse and neglect. Vulnerable populations. This patient's dependent on others, children, and other adults more vulnerable to physical, sexual abuse, exploitation, and neglect. We're looking for stories that are inconsistent with injuries, multiple injuries at various stages of healing. If a kid's got bruises all over them, are they a normal kid that just has, is completely normal, or are they getting beat? That's, that's a very hard question to answer because kids get bruises all over, right? Repeated injuries. Maybe the caregivers some, show some sort of indifference to the patient. That could be a big sign. We never make accusations. We want to do the best to get the patient out of the environment, and then we report suspicious activity according to our local jurisdiction, local protocol. Um, we contact the children's division and have them check it out, okay? That is special populations. 
And next thing we'll do is a review before the, the next test.